Hello, welcome to another video tutorial. In this video tutorial, you will not be listening to me. As I've mentioned on many of my previous live streams and other videos, I'm hoping to have a playlist of many guests coming in to present on a variety of topics, in particular topics that I might not use in my regular programming life. And um, uh, so I'm excited to try this new experiment with essentially, we, I had a guest before with an interview, but this is the first guest tutorial uh, with Tiga Brain. So this is Tiga's website. Uh, Tiga is an artist and educator. She teaches at a variety of places, including School for Poetic Computation, which is the school where I am standing right now, um, sfpc.io that you're interested in. If you're interested in, um, that's the URL. And um, Tiga's gonna show you some stuff about physical devices and sensors, a, a topic of which I have a sort of pathologi pathological fear of anything um, physical, which is why I tend to stick with software. So I'm um, excited to introduce and have Tiga here in the studio with a couple different video tutorials. And here she is. Hello. Um, today we're going to be talking about environmental sensing um, and how to connect a couple of different forms of microcontrollers to P5JS. And we're going to be making data-driven animations. So. Because we live in this time where there's a lot of excitement about the Internet of Things, there's a lot of excitement about wireless technologies, there have been a whole lot of different options and different boards that have come out that allow us to connect a microcontroller wirelessly to a server somewhere and then using P5 we can connect to that server and use the data or control that little microcontroller to that little computer in various ways. Um, this is exciting because it means, basically, if you think about a microcontro microcontroller as a little computer, it means that we can um, build circuits on these microcontrollers that allow us to collect data and place sensors in different weird places um, to collect information about the world. So imagine if you wanted to create some sort of animation that is using data from a particular environment or a particular location of your choice. Um, if you can set up a wireless network here uh, in that place, you would be able to set up a sensor network or collect information from that site, put it onto um, the cloud, you know, on, online, and then create some sort of um, P5JS uh, animation that can um, allow you to use that information coming from that particular site. So this stuff is really interesting and there's been lots of sort of examples of communities who set up um, environmental sensing networks in order to like find out more about what's happening in their in their local environment. So we can sense things like pollutant levels, we can sense things like noise levels, light levels, um, Motion, if you're interested in looking at sort of, um, I don't know, b animal populations or like sensing something that's happening in a bird box or so on. Um, these sorts of technologies might allow you to prototype that sort of thing. So the two boards that I'm going to look at first in this tutorial and then the one that follows is the particle board, which is a little microcontroller that plays really well with Wi-Fi and has a whole lot of... Um, GPIO pins, general purpose in-out pins that if you're familiar with Arduino, you will have used. Um, and so we can set up our own sensors and circuits on the particle and then put this data in the cloud. So let's just walk over to this whiteboard. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to set up a circuit on, this is the particle. And we set up the particle to talk wirelessly to, you know, our Wi-Fi router, wherever that is in our, in our situation, in our house or whatever. And then that Wi-Fi router is connected to, you know, the, the cloud or the internet out here. And then we uh, have our little computer with P5 running on it that then is going to be getting information from the, the internet, right? So I'm just going to show you a particle board with a, a light dependent resistor. So a light sensor that is attached to it. So this light sensor is on a little circuit and basically it's going to give us a value that indicates what the light levels are at the location of the board. 
And so this value is then pinged up to our Wi-Fi router. And the nice thing about the particle is it comes with this whole um, platform that deals with the management of the data on, on the server and on the internet. Um, so it saves us from having to set a lot of that stuff up for ourselves. And so the data that we collect on the light sensor goes through our router to the internet and then at the other end we will use that data in a P5 sketch to animate something. Um, okay, so the as I said, the, the circuit, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about setting up the circuit on the actual um, particle board because I'm just using the sort of basic example that they have very well documented on their website. So if you end up getting one of these and working through their sort of getting started tutorial, what I'm working with here is, a, is um, a circuit that has the light sensor on it and a circuit that has an LED on it. So I'll just spend a couple of minutes going through the actual particle documentation and website just so you've, we can have a look at it. Um, so that's at particle.io and uh, the boards look like this. There's a few different types of them. There's also one that actually can connect um, to cellular, net cellular, cellular networks. <laughs> I, can't, I can't talk today. Um, and so that, that if you use um, the cellular one, it means that you could set up, say, a sensor somewhere where there isn't even a Wi-Fi network. And if you buy a SIM card, you could get data that way. So if you wanted to do some you know online project where you need information from a, like a remote site somewhere um, this is is an option for how you might manage that um, because the data can come over the network that our um, mobiles operate on so we're going to be using the photon today um, and there's all these sorts of information about getting set up connecting um, I'm not going to go through the whole Wi-Fi connection process because it's pretty straightforward. Um, so these, this um, board is already on the Wi-Fi network that I have, have, we've got here in the studio. Um, the, we program the particle board using their web API. So they actually have an API online, oh, sorry, their web IDE, so their web integrated development environment. So this is a place where we can actually write the code that we want to run on this little microcontroller. You know, listen to this pin, send me this data, turn the LED on, turn the LED off, all that sort of stuff. Um, and this code is uploaded to the particle via the Wi-Fi network. Um, so it's, there's quite a nice workflow because they have this web IDE we can use. Um, and down here you see the examples that you know it ships with so you can go through and have a look at the various things it can do by uploading these examples to it so if we just have a look at the you know 101 physical computing example which is always the blink LED if I bring that up you can see the code there in the editor and up here these icons are sort of the place where we send it to the board so if we're writing code for ourselves, we would verify this code so that we're not sending, you know, terrible syntax errors to our board. Um, and then once we've figured out all our debugging and our, our errors, we then flash it to the board. So if I click flash, you can see that the code's now going over through the Wi-Fi network and hopefully it's arriving down here at the particle. And we can see some lights flashing and should the data's coming in and the LED that I've get set up now, you can see it's blinking. So we know that we've got our Wi-Fi network set up correctly and we've got this blinking LED, which is awesome. Um, so that's, that's basic setup. This example is the standard um, example that is explained really well on the Particle website. So I didn't write this code, um, and you can see it's commented really well. Um, so I don't want to spend too long on it. Um, but if we have a quick look, you'll notice that the syntax is, very, is basically the same as using Arduino. So if you've used any kind of like Arduino 
um, boards and done any sort of projects with Arduino, you'll be quite um, comfortable with the functions you see here. So basically, we've got a variable called LED, which equals D0. So this is referring to the pin that our LED is on, on the particle board. We've got one for our photoresistor as well on A0. So that's on one of the analog pins on our particle board. We've got one some dealing with some power and we, we've also got a variable called analog value. It is a variable that we're going to capture the value coming from our light sensor. If we jump down to void setup, you'll be seeing all these you know, nice familiar um, functions if, uh, that you'll recognize from Arduino. So pin mode, we're setting all our pins to either output or input. Output, if, it's, if they're going to be pins for actuators, things like lights or motors. Input pins, if they're listening pins, so if they're listening for data from sensors. So you can see that our photoresistor is on an input pin. Um, what the, the, the line that I think we need to talk about is this particle dot variable function. So within the particle environment, there's a class, the particle class, that has a whole lot of functions in it that allow us to program how our board is talking to their software that's running on a server, you know, in a desert somewhere. Um, and this particle dot variable, so we're using a function called variable that's in that class. And you can see that it has three arguments. The first argument is a string and it's defining our variable name. So the variable name that we are setting up on the actual particle cloud or particle server is called analog value here. Um, there's a, ooh, I'm zooming out. Um, there is a second argument, which is analog value, and then we're saying that this is an int. So this uh, function is unique to this particular system we're using, and it means that we can then call that variable analog value when we set up our P5 um, sketch later, because it's actually like a spot in memory that we're kind of like reserving on their um, system, on their environment. Um, so just jumping quickly through this, uh, you can see in void loop, we are reading values from the photoresistor pin. There's a delay so that we don't do it constantly. And then there's also a little bit of code at the bottom where they're also toggling the LED off, but basically that's irrelevant to us. So, so once we're happy with this program, and it's sensing and we've set up the reading and writing to the particle board as we want it. We then go up here, we verify our code. It's gonna tell us if there are any errors in it. You can see code verified, great work. So we're good to go. And then we can flash this to our board. So the code is going up into the internet and is arriving at our board. Now we're gonna look at this part. So we're gonna look at writing the P5 code that's getting the data that's sitting um, on the particle cloud. Okay, so now is the P5.js part and I have this really simple example set up in P5 that it allows us to get data from the internet, from our, um, the variable that we set up to hold our light sensor data back into our P5 sketch so we can do something with it. So how do we do that? Let's have a look at this sketch. So you can see I have a number of global variables set up. We have one that's going to contain our data. We have one that's going to specifically contain our um, light reading. And then I have a variable called current M, which is containing the milliseconds the, that the reading takes place. So I've got a canvas here of 500, 500, as you can see. And then this is the important bit. This is the interesting bit. So we have this URL call. So as I mentioned, Particle uses the REST, a REST API. And if you don't know what a REST API is, go and watch some of Dan's videos on REST APIs. Um, but a REST API allows us to call it and get some data from it. Um, and so we use an HTTPS call to do this. 
and let's take a look at how we construct this HTTPS call. So if I jump back to my browser, um, we can have a better look at what, what, how to construct this URL. So this H, you can see it's HTTPS API.particle.io. So we're talking to the particle um, API and for the different ways you can construct calls that is documented in their API. V1 slash devices and then this number. So this number has to reflect the device number that is associated with the board that we are sensing on. Uh, if we jump back and have a quick look, you're, you, I think I mentioned before that this device number is listed on their web IDE and we can copy it and then paste it into this URL. Um, analog question mark, so we want to specifically get the variable that we set up called analog value on that server. And then we need the access token, so we need that authentication part. Again, which we can see here on their web um, URL, access token, so you will have your unique one, you need to copy it and place it in this, um, in this URL. And so if I call that um, URL that we've constructed from using all the different um, uh, values that we have for this board, you can see that it's returning to me some JSON data. And it's returning to me the data in this JSON format that is specific to that analog value variable that we set up before. Again, if you're not sure what JSON is or you can't really remember how to deal with it, Dan's done some videos on that. So pause this, go check them out and then come back to us. Um, but you can see that the particle API returns us these values in the format with the name value um, of name value pairs, which is you know, fundamental to, to the JSON um, data structure. And when we ask for that information, you can see we get some information, a thing called name, which is our, sense, our variable name, the value, and it has a bunch of other information in it, like the last time that the data was logged, is it connected or not, some more information about time, and the device ID and the, some information about the product. So all that's there coming in to our P5 sketch. So after we put that um, URL together, we can then use the load JSON function in, process in, in P5. And so this load JSON function is really handy when we need to talk to REST APIs. And again, there's a number of videos on how to do this, so if you need a refresher on APIs, go and have a look at them. But the load JSON function is that lovely, the lovely thing called a callback function, right? So it helps us deal with the asynchronicity of JavaScript. And in this case, we want to send the specific URL that we're using out to the internet, and we don't want to do anything else until we've got the data back. So we're going to use the, the callback function to manage that process. So we send the URL, load JSON sends the URL and waiting, waiting, waiting. Eventually the data comes back and the data then gets passed into this variable we've get, got set up called data. So it's going to have all that JSON stuff that we just looked at in it. And only once that data's come back, will it then run this second part, this second argument, which is a function that we can see set up at the bottom of the code here called pass data. And so this second function then gets the JSON data. We just specifically get the reading, the dot result part of the JSON data out and we put in a variable called reading. Jumping back over here, you can see that the, there's this line three, there's this value called 429 and it's, its name is result, which is why we are going data dot result, right? So we get that number and then it's going to just print out in the console. So if I run that, you can see that, ooh, it's a little bit, um, a little bit hard to read there. So you can see we're getting this thing called reading and it's 418. So if I um, shade, put shade over my sensor, eventually we will see that number. Oh, then I have to reload my, sense, my um, sketch. You can see that it's come out to be a different number because I'm you know, playing around, putting my hand over it, getting lower. 
If I completely cover it up, we should see that reading go way down. So there it is at 41, right? So I'm doing just a little bit of like um, checking that everything's working as I think it should. But we've successfully set that up. So from that JSON, we're pulling out the, the reading result and then just printing it out in the console. So what can we do with that now? Um, you can see there as I was playing around, like it almost updates in, in real time. There's sort of like a, a, a little bit of a latency, but it's not too bad. I'm a little bit cautious of doing this whole API call in draw because we know that draw runs, you know, about 50, 60 um, loops per second and most APIs have rate limits on them. And so if you violate the rate limit, you know, sometimes you can get blocked or whatever. So I'm going to set it up here so that we are querying the API, like maybe once every second or two, just in case. Um, so basically, our sketch at the moment is just calling the API once and then printing that reading out to our console. So we want to call it multiple times now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a new function called call API. And basically it's going to have all of this stuff that's in setup in it. Um, it's going to take our URL. It's going to use the load JSON function to get the data back. It's then once it has that back, it's going to use the function pass data uh, and it's taking note of the time. So it's putting the current milliseconds, so the amount of time that's passed since the start of the sketch into um, this variable we've got called current m to, to understand what moment this happened in. And so now if I want to um, see that data respond, um, we need to set up an if statement so that we can call it every second or, go, or so. So if we go if, and I'm going to use the millis function, which is the millisecond since the start of the sketch. So if millis minus um, current m, which is the milliseconds, the, the, the moment, the value for millis when we took the data reading. So if millis minus current m is uh, greater than 2000, so that'll do it every two seconds, because there's a thousand milliseconds in a second, then uh, I want to call my API. So then I want to call that, that lovely um, function that I just wrote that will get our data in. So let's, let's see if that works for us. Um, so I've got the reading. If I cover up my, you can see that, right, so now I am printing it out to the console in every second or so as, as my data is changing. So that appears to be working. So let's now then do something with that data. I'm putting the data in the, in the um, variable called reading. So if we want to just print it out to the screen, we go reading and we'll just place it up there at 2020. And then how about we also write an ellipse so uh, that changes size maybe with the um, value that's coming in off the sensor. So width height is reading reading and we'll just place it in the center of the screen, width on two, height on two. Um, and then perhaps I want to just refresh my background every time I get some new data so that it doesn't look too crazy. So I'm just going to put a background call at the top of my past data function, which is the function that only gets called when the data comes in. Um, and I put it, made it, made it red there. So what's going on? I drew my ellipse at zero, zero, because there wasn't any data there yet. Um, and we can see, this, so I've got, I've put my background in the wrong place again. So let's just pick it up. And I think if we put it at the top of call API, it should look a little bit better. There, that looks a bit better, doesn't it? 
oh, and I've done this, I've got my ellipse function all mixed up. We actually want it to be x, y, width, height. So it's actually got to be width on two, height on two, reading, reading. So that will fix my ellipse location. That's looking better. All right, so now you can see that my ellipse is changing size just slightly with my different readings coming in. Um, if I put this sensor in darkness, so I'm covering it up, you can see that my ellipse gets really nice and small and then bigger again. So it's, it's responding quite nicely. If I wanted to be a bit more responsive, you know, I, instead of every two seconds, I might say every 500 milliseconds, so every half a second. And so there you can see it responds much, much quicker. And so, I mean, the great thing about this sort of setup is even though, you know, I have this particle tethered to my computer, the only reason I have it tethered like this um, is for power. So we could get a battery pack, pop it on the particle and throw the particle up into a tree nearby and as long as it can hear the Wi-Fi, it will then broadcast these light sensor values to us, which we can then play around with in a sketch such as this one. So it really um, kind of expands the questions you can ask and the sort of information that you can collect about the world and then use in, in your projects to create you know, things that are interactive and responsive to um, a, a particular environment. So I think there's lots of potential for this um, in the world of data visualization. And also, I, you know, sometimes I make public art. So thinking about um, making interventions that respond to their location or respond to a site of interest. Um, these sort of technologies will allow you to do that. All right, thank you.